professor here of marine science at Stony Brook Southampton. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, last of our spring uh, Friday evening lectures. Uh, I'll remind everybody we're going to take the summer off. Uh, we're actually going to take the summer and do a lot of field work. Uh, people have been out in the bays uh, for weeks already studying all the stuff that's going on out here. But the uh, Friday evening lecture series will start up again in September, uh, first Friday in September, uh, speaker to be determined. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who is one of our department's <coughs> newest faculty members, uh, Nils Falkenborn, uh, is joined us as of uh, August, or, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, uh, Nils' background, he got his uh, doctorate degree from the University of Bremen in Germany, uh, and he came over to the States and did a postdoc in South Carolina, uh, then went over to France, uh, to Ipremier, to continue, uh, or do an additional postdoc, and then he came here to Stony Brook, and we're very excited to have him as part of our new uh, biogeochemistry mafia, uh, which is <laughs> soon to take over the planet. Um, he's going to talk about a lot of interesting research that he's been doing, but the, the biggest news in Nils' lab is he got seawater and animals uh, in his lab at Stony Brook uh, this week. Thanks to Andrew. Thanks to Andy, Andy who uh, <laughs> jumped in the water without a wetsuit. So. Oh. And with goggles that's, like this. That's what grad <laughs> students are for. Uh, so with that, we'll let Nils uh, tell us about his research. Thank you very much, Joe. And thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate being here in the summer Friday evening uh, that you all came. And uh, you're interested in the seafloor, I hope. At least I am very much interested in the seafloor. And I'm spe specifically interested in how animals that dwell in the seafloor affect the functioning of those. And one reason why I'm interested in the seafloor is that these are pretty much the largest, largest ecosystem on Earth. I mean, 70% are ocean, and so all the bottom is seafloor. And lots of this, lots of the seafloor, uh, most of the seafloor is sedimentary. So sand, muds, different types of sediments, but most looks like this. And in principle, we can say sediments are a 50-50 mixture of particles and pore space. So sediment obviously has pore space which is filled with water, which is typically called pore water. So water is interstitial water. And lots of the chemical reaction take place in between these sand grains. The sand grains provide the surface for bacteria to sit on and well, lots of animals are dwelling in, the, in, in, these, in these sediments. I want to start with a very broad picture on the seafloor because the the seafloor is not the same always. So seafloor is, uh, new seafloor is formed, very old seafloor is subducted due to the drift of continents in, con in uh, well, we have very old sediments here east of Asia and also very old sediments here just in front of, uh, well, Long Island. And we have pretty new seafloor along the ridges like the mid-Atlantic ridge where volcanic eruptions bring up new magma forming new seafloor. So we have a whole range of <coughs> ages of, of seafloor, and this is just to remember. This is not all; it's not always the same. It's changing over very long time periods. This graph gives you an elevation of the entire Earth um, and the histogram of this. So, if we go from very high altitude, like the Mount Everest, which is obviously just a little tiny part of the Earth's, Earth's surface, the same is true for the very deep part, like the Mariana Trench, just a little bit. But if you then look over the entire Earth, it's quite obvious that most of the Earth is really like between 4,000 and 6,000 meter depth. So pretty high depth. And um, this is basically how the Earth look like, looks like. The seafloor is not even. There are huge seascapes underwater. So this is a very nice drawing of Heinrich Baron, which is actually an Austrian. Uh, it's funny that an Austrian made these maps of underwater, um, uh, of the underwater topography. It's probably not super correct, but it gives you an idea about, well, these really shallow ocean shelf areas, coastal sediments and shelf seas, which are really, well, less than 200 meter depth. We then come to the continental slopes, which fall to several thousand meter depth. We have these abyssal plains. We have these huge ocean ridges. Every now and then some volcanoes stick, up, stick out of the uh, sea, uh, uh, sea surface, which are then, well, the Canary Islands or the Azores here. So it's quite a, well, it's a huge, vast area. And 
as you may have heard, we probably know less about the seafloor than we know about the surface of the moon because it's so large and it's so hard to, to see what's, what's there. And most of it looks like this if you would go there. <laughs> Fortunately, we have, well, lights and we go down <coughs> there with ROVs, uh, we go down there with uh, sampling devices to look what's there. And uh, we'll just show you some photographs from different regions. This is in the uh, Larsen B area close to Antarctica. You see lots of these deep sea sea cucumbers. Uh, this is an, another station uh, between uh, Florida and the Bahamas. Also here you see lots of tubes sticking out of the sediment. These, I think, are lasers to, to give you an idea of about the size of this area. I don't know really the size. I would think that this is, these are probably like 10 or 20 square meters or so. Uh, this is a nice picture, I think. This is made in the Mon Monterey Canyon uh, at uh, 3,200 meter depth. And, well, they found this chair there. This picture, well, obviously shows that we have already a huge impact, even on these very deep, deep parts of the seafloor. Um, well, because we, well, this is very obvious, but obviously the non-obvious things are probably more dangerous for these ecosystems. What's also obvious in this picture is that these deep oceans, um, you have a lot, a lot of particles in the water, the marine snow, and many, much of the life in the seafloor depends on these particles falling to the ground as a food source. This year is, a, I think, a very nice time-lapse movie, taking at 4,500 meter depth and over several months. Uh, this is just 30 seconds, uh, several months and 30, 30 seconds. And again, you see lots of activity in these sediments. These are probably shrimp burrows. I will talk about these shrimps in a while. But well, every now and then you see a large animal passing by, but you can also see that this entire sand seems to be alive due to the activities of these organisms. <coughs> so these, these habitats are extremely difficult to investigate because 4,500 uh, 4, meters, this is a pretty large distance. And whatever you bring down there, it's very tricky to get samples. So, <coughs> I went to Google, Google Earth, and this is the Central Park in New York. So this is five, five kilometers. So this is basically where the boats are to sample down what's there. So, and the devices that we typically use look like this. So imagine this thing going down from where we see now New York, going down to Central Park. I mean, it's a matter of luck what you get. You may end up in the Hudson River. You may end up on one of these houses or somewhere in the Central Park. And now imagine you want to see what insects are in the central park with this device. You would need thousands of these samples to get an idea of what's there. And this is why it's so complicated or so difficult to get an idea about biodiversity in, uh, in, in these systems. And still every trip, every cruise out going, going out there still discovers totally new species and not only the very tiny ones but also pretty large species because it's well, so, such a difficult environment. This is why I really like these shallow, shallow seas, because their working is much, much easier. They um, represent a part of the seafloor that is easy accessible for research. Um, and so that's one nice thing about them. They are also extremely important. So these coastal sediments, the upper 200 meter, uh, they only cover 9% of the ocean. But in this region, more than 80% of all the sedimentary organic mineralization takes place. Because in these deeper waters, the organic material is already consumed when it hits the surface. So that's why these systems are so extremely, uh, or this is one reason why these systems are so extremely productive. The other reason is that because the water is shallow, you got sunlight to the seafloor. So you probably all know there are huge seagrass or many different seagrass species. These flowering plants uh, can uh, extend over vast areas, and they are obviously an important habitat for many, many other species. Um, but a lot of the seafloor, the intertidal, where you can go twice a day, which is very nice, uh, often looks like this, so bare sand. And actually, the brown color that you see there um, are microscopic little algae, the diatoms. And they really are the, the base of the food chain or food, food web in these systems. And 
such intertidal flats can be extremely productive. They can even more be more productive than the tropical rainforest. So when you look at this, it doesn't look, well, there is not much. There are some cells and so on, but it's not so, so much a matter of the standing stock of biomass, but much more the productivity. So it's a very high turnover here. Many animals graze on these diatoms, and they are then their own. Are, uh, other organisms prey on those. So there's a huge turn turnover. The fish come there during high tide, eating all the <coughs> smaller animals. Birds go there during low tide, feeding on the benthic organisms. They feed on these diatoms. So there's a very high turnover, making, even though the standing stock of biomass may not be very high, there may be like uh, several hundred grams per carbon uh, in biomass produced every year in these tidal flats. And because there are so many diatoms, there are uh, some animals which are well, extremely efficient in, in uh, getting this, this food source. So this is an intertidal flat where I did my PhD thesis. This is the northern part of Germany here. Down here are the Netherlands. And this area here is the Wadden Sea. Uh, these are all barrier islands, just like we have here in the US. But uh, unlike here, the, the, the areas behind the barrier islands are extremely shallow. So most of these areas behind the barrier islands, they fall dry during low tide. And actually 70% of this entire area, so these are about 800 kilometers of uh, coastline, they look like this. So this, this worm who is responsible for these spaghetti mounds, he is a really prominent member of the Benthic community uh, in the Wadden Sea. And so this was my PhD thesis to find out, more, uh, find out more about them. If you dig into the sediment, you will see that these worms, they sit in about 20, 20 30 centimeter depth. And oftentimes you find surrounding these, uh, surrounding the body of these animals, uh, these oxygenated pockets already suggest, suggesting that they pump a lot of oxygen into the sediment. If you put such an animal in an aquarium like this, um, they will sit here in a J-shaped burrow. Every now and then you see, see this worm crawling down here. They feed down here at depth by subducting the sur surface material with all these mi microalgae. And then they defecate the cleaned, well, the, the digested sand up here. So there's just 1% organic matter in this sediment. So they have to, have to eat a lot to, to feed their la large body. And eventually feed out, uh, defecate out of the aquarium. This is a tidal flat in, uh, in South Africa. This is a tidal flat in Oregon. The, the South Africa and Oregon, this is a different species. These are burrowing shrimp. So again, vast areas occupied by these animals, several hundred per square meter. These shrimp build rather complex burrows, typically like larger areas and then narrow areas. In these larger areas, they can do somersaults to turn in their burrows. And this is how they irrigate the burrow. They stick their tail into these narrow parts of the burrow, and then with their pleopods, with these, uh, they, they, they pump the water through the burrow. Sometimes they have two or three openings, uh, and they are very active in cruising around, exploring the sediment for food. So these are also deposit feeders. They are also shrimp species that are suspension feeders that pump much more water, but don't build such, such extensive burrows. So this, this video shows you a little bit more how these, how these animals establish a burrow over, I think this is a three-day period, so it's 10,000 fold speed. Um, um, if it would be a bit of a darker, you would see how the sediment surrounding the burrow over time turns light, lightish, because they pump all this oxygen in the, in, the, in, in the sediment, which then oxidize the iron sulfides in the sediment. So eventually it managed to open to, to, to open the burrow on the other side. So this is what they like, having multiple openings and pumping water then through the burrow. These here are uh, urchins in New Zealand. They are also burrowing. As you can see, I did a little hypoxia experiment, but once I increase oxygen, they directly start burrowing, cruising through the sediment, stirring the upper few centimeters of the sediment, uh, and uh, also deposit feeding on these. These urchins can, are, are very abundant around New Zealand. So what the lugworms are in the one sea, or what the thalassinids, these burrowing shrimp, are on the west coast of the US, these urchins are the dominant species in many uh, shallow areas in New Zealand. 
Sometimes we also only see some traces, so we do not, do not really see mounds or so, so these are the feeding traces of a bivalve. This bivalve is a uh, telinic bivalve. Um, they sit in 10, 15, 20 centimeter depth. <coughs> with their incurrent siphon, they collect surface sediment with, again, with all these microalgae in them. Uh, and as you can see, like a mold, they go through new places, and this is what forms these, these flower-like patterns on the surface. They have this rather long incurrent siphon, but they also have an excurrent siphon, which typically sits below the sediment surface. So whenever they in injecting water and sediment up here, they're injecting water at depth into the sediment. Another 10,000 speeded up video of this. So this is again the incurrent siphon of this animal. Here you can see this area where at some depth the excurrent siphon sits. You see all the sediment movement there. And in a moment, this animal will move this incurrent siphon to another place. And now what? look at this area. So it's still there, and eventually you see that this area is getting really dark reddish brownish, potentially or very likely because there was so much organic mineralization and nutrient release that now lots of microfilobenthos grew there. So to some extent these animals, they fertilize the sediment by their activities. They are not only like burrowing and destabilizing organisms, obviously there are also lots of tube building forms of infauna, which typically, well, build these tubes, sitting in these tubes to protect themselves from the sulfitic environment. Um, and some of them really can build up kind of reefs. This is a very prominent worm in um, also much of the North Sea, it's Nanichi Conchilega. But there are also very interesting uh, tube building worms out here. I will talk about these in a moment. So lots of diver diversity in the seafloor, and this is a very old concept on where we can find which species. Um, and um, what is typically happens, and there are some interesting parallels, if you go from a physically disturbed area, so for example, a big dredge killed most of the animals, or there was a hypoxic event, so no oxygen, all the animals died at a specific location, then it will take some time until these deep burrowing fauna comes back to, to the environment. The same is true if you have a very polluted area. Um, if you go back in a, well, at a distance from this solution, uh, pollution source, you will see that close to the pollution source, you will typically have these very small opportunistic species. And the more pristine the environment is, you also find these larger burrowing organisms like these burrowing urchins. This has not been always, this has not been always like this. So there was something that is called the Cambrium substrate revolution. So about well, a little bit more than 500 million years ago, the oceans looked pretty much like this. It was well, basically one dimensional. So uh, it was dominated by microbial mats, no animals burrowing in the seafloor. Uh, and only then animals, potentially because evolution brought up so many um, predators that animals started to find a way to, to hide, so they started burrowing into the sediment, and eventually it turned out this is also a really nice source of food. So in this area we really find a huge shift in these benthic communities, and now we, there is more and more evidence that due to this shift, due to this increase in burrowing activity, there was also a dramatic increase in the chemistry of the ocean. For example, an increase in, in sulfate during this era it's pro has probably to do with the, with the onset of biotubation and the release of sulfates from the, setting, from the sea floor. Today, if you give it a rough average, so how deep do animals go over the entire sea floor, it's about 10 centimeters. Obviously, in coastal area, it can be two meters if you have large burrowing organisms. In other areas, maybe just the upper one centimeter. But, well, this is an average based on, on uh, lots of literature and a model. So just to give you a rough idea. So the, the key concept here, or the key term here also for my work is biotubation, which is basically the displacement of solids and fluids by organisms. And it's not only by these informal organisms. Biotubation also occurs by animals that come from above. So this is a picture uh, taken in Australia. All these pits are made by stingrays going there during high tide, 
looking for benthic organisms, uh, burying for them and eating them. These are pits of feeding gray whales in, in, in Washington. So these gray whales, they really like going to these thalassinids beds, to these burrowing shrimp beds, taking a good chunk of the, mu uh, of the mud, and with this, the, the shrimp, so just like the krill in the water, some of these whales, they are really focused on getting their food from the sediment. And if they are 500 per square meter, then you get a good chunk well, with such a bite. So my work on biogeochemistry is, well, it's, it's really fun because it combines so many different disciplines and, uh, well, they all are related in this field of biogeochemistry. And as I mentioned in my, um, in my short abstract for this talk today, this also takes place on, on Earth. So you all know earthworms, and they are probably, or they are definitely also extremely important for, uh, for, for the soils. And Charles Darwin wrote his last book actually about the action of worms and the formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms. Uh, so after publishing his original spe species book, he wrote this book because over his lifetime he did lots of experiments with his little son in the basement, uh, putting different layers of sediment, adding worms, seeing how they integrate this material and so on. And it's a very nice little book. Uh, obviously it's online available. available. Um, I just want to read this little, little passage from it. When we behold a wide turf-covered expanse, we should remember that its smoothness, on which so much of its beauty depends, is mainly due to all the inequalities having been slowly leveled by worms. It is a marvelous reflection of the whole of the superficial mold over any su such expanse has passed and will pass again every few years through the bodies of worms. The plow is one of the most ancient and most valuable of man's inventions, but long before he existed, the land was in fact regularly plowed and still continues to, to thus plow by earthworms. It may be doubted whether there are any other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly, uh, uh, lowly organized creatures. So what I find very nice about this is that Charles Darwin, he really uh, appreciated the fact that some of these processes are so slow, so you will not see them in a human lifetime. But if you have a, if, if you have a, a, a um, an area with a with a slight slope, and you have earthworms everywhere that bring up pieces like this, rain will wash it away, will bring it to the lower parts. So over a very long time period, this process will level this field from the light, slightly sloped area to a to a level area. And so, well, I, th I think that's really neat that, um, but, well, in the seafloor, as you can <coughs> see, it may be just like this. And to find out more what these animals are doing, one very straightforward approach, an approach that I really like, is doing ex experiments. And with these worms, it's very simple to do experiments because these are one of the few species in this area that burrow that deep. So by inserting a, a mesh, uh, like this into the sediment, let's say a 10 centimeter depth. These worms will not like this area anymore because they want to go deeper. The ones that are there will probably call, crawl sidewards and new, new will not settle there. So if you then cover this, you will have a lugworm exclusion site. Well, my doctor father said, that's nice, we have done this and we got some interesting results, but please take a backhoe and make it larger. <laughs> because on these small plots, you if you imagine there are tidal currents and so on, so some of the effects that these worms may have, you may not be able to see on these small plots there because there's such a large lateral sed sediment drift. So we decided to build these 20 by 20 meter plots. That's me sitting in the mud. The backhoe was dredging away the upper 10 centimeters. I was rolling out this mesh sediment on top again. <coughs> and what we ended with are these 20 by 20 meter exclusion plots. So there's one, there's another one. Altogether, I had six of those, and obviously control plots, which are dredged in the same way. So over several years, these were permanent exclusion plots, so over several years I could look how sediment will change, how the banded community changes in the absence of worms compared to plots with the worms. And you can see it from Google Earth. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so and I just want to give you not many graphs, just some, some ideas. So as you can see, the Sediment, obviously, depending on the season. Here it was 
lots of microfluidic bamboos on these. They, they, this, is, this is why you see this, this funny pattern here on the surface. Uh, in, in one year, you see all these little dots here, which are all these Q-building worms. And you can see that it's not super obvious, but here they are almost not, or much less, and here the density was much higher. So tube-building polychaetes took advantage of the absence of this worm, which is constantly uh, destabilizing and bioturbating the sediment. Now these little dots are juvenile lug worms. So they also really like these areas where there are no adults, because they build relatively small burrows. So if they are in an area where there are adults, they probably always suck to death. So they really like these plots. And more importantly, um, these exclusion plots, they uh, the, the sediment in these plots really changed from a very sandy sediment to a much more muddy sediment. So, and potentially this was the trigger for these juveniles to go there. So there were many of these sediment mediated effects. So lacrum exclusion resulted in a change of the sediment and then uh, in turn in a change of the benthic community. So here you see lots of algae uh, on the surface. Again, this is the border of the exclusion plot, hard to see here. So um, again, I will talk about this in a moment, why there were so many algae on this plot here. And even seagrasses invaded this or set, uh, became established on these exclusion plots. Again, potentially because the sediment was, was much more stable. So two examples which happened in two different years. Some cube building polychaetes took advantage of the absence of lugworms, or due to changes in the sediment, they really liked the sediment more. Then in both years, different species, but in both years, some algae got attached to these cubes and then covered these exclusion plots. And then later in the year, as you can see here, later in the year, then when juvenile bivalves started to recruit, and many of these are recruiting by, with bristles, well, actually I should show the photo, are recruiting and having these bristles threads. So they drift around until this bristle thread gets anchored to something. So obviously these algae and tubes they increased the, the success of recruitment of these bivalves. So in both years, sometimes in the mid intertidal, sometimes in the low intertidal, these two bivalves, they showed a much, much higher recruitment on the exclusion plots. So there is some contingency in these, effect, uh, in these effects that you saw. Um, they happen not in every year. It really depends on the recruits. It depends on timing. But these effects were very, very obvious. Another thing that was obvious from time to time was, again, this here is the exclusion site. This is the um, site with lug worms. Well, it's just, I had real control plots, but this is just to show you the border. In this case, there was a lot of microfetal benthos growing in the presence of lug worms. That was not always the case because they, al they also feed on those, but that was in winter. In winter, the, the lug worms were probably not very active anymore. So I got a little bit more into detail. I uh, built this pore water lens to get samples of pore water from these plots. And so from these different depths of pore water, I could reconstruct these profiles going from the lugworm side to the lugworm exclusion side, here indicated by this mesh. So on the, this is one nutrient that is really important for these tiny algae. So you can see that on the exclusion side, Lots of nutrients were there at depth, but not available to the microfetal benthos at the, at, depth, uh, at the surface. While on the exclusion plot, hardly any of the silicate was, was down there, but uh, actually at the surface, concentrations were higher because these animals probably bring up these nutrients to the surface and make them available to microfetal benthos. One way to measure microfetal benthos is measuring chlorophyll, and typically people take cores. Now there are very ni neat new technologies like these hyperspectral cameras with which we can scan the surface and based on the absorption of, of the light, we can then estimate chlorophyll con uh, concentrations at the sediment surface. So this is a map showing about uh, one or half a meter of, of sediment. The blue areas are, uh, well, it's lugworm feces, so very low in chlorophyll. But in this, in between, you see these very productive areas are at these very high standing stocks of, of chlorophyll or diatoms in, 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 in these regions. So we were cu curious if the lugworm itself may have an Im impact on this. So what we did is we, instead of having animals here down in these buckets, we used these peristaltic pumps 
to pump water just as a worm would do. So in each of these buckets, we pump exactly at the same rate like the worms do. And then we measured with this camera the microfetobenthos at the sediment surface with repeated scans. So this is how the buckets look like. The inlet is in uh, 15 centimeter depth and we pump about 1.5 milliliter per minute, not very much. So these are the buckets. Well, what is first of all, what is obvious is that the diatoms, they migrate. So they go up and down. This is not something new, but it's very nice with this technique, you really can visualize this. So during daytime, they come up when, come up when there is sunlight. During nighttime, they go down. But then after a few days, it was very obvious that the buckets we irrigated with like 1.5 mils per minute, it's like a drop, another drop. So it's very little water. But still, this has a huge effect on the chlorophyll at the sediment surface. So basically, these worms, they garden their own food at the sediment surface by irrigating. So many of, many of these animals, they don't live in a pipe like this. There's a lot of exchange between the burrow and the surrounding water. <coughs> and Bob Aller, uh, at, in our school, he did a lot of work on this and really important work, influential work, about uh, uh, models that, that describe these situations where you have a burrow in the sediment and there's diffusion between the burrow uh, water and the surrounding sediment. Um, but even this is not always true. Like with a luck worm, you have a worm with a blind ending burrow that really pushes the water, has to push the water into the sediment. So this Philip Meisman, he worked a little bit more on this. He called it a pocket, pocket injection model. So if an animal pumps water here into the sediment, um, then this process should include pressure gradients. And these pressure gradients should depend what we call on the permeability of the sediment. And these pressure gradients, we thought, we should be able to measure those. So David, uh, David Weddy and Sally Wooden, they built these pressure sensors, adjusted them. Here they are, adjusted them to these intertidal sites. So these are pressure sensors. We stick them into the sediment. And indeed, we could measure something. So just to show you that these lacworms, they all, all also occur on the west coast of the US. This is a different species. But they do these peristaltic movements. And with each wave, they pump one package of water into the sediment. So when we stick these poor water pressure sensors in the sediment, we could indeed see all this. So we could see whenever one peristaltic pump, uh, uh, one peristaltic wave, uh, wave moved water, we could see this at, at, at least at this, uh, like as, as a little bump in the pressure record. Every now and then we got a big signal, which is due to a defecation. These signals, like ups and downs, are when the worm is burrowing. So from these pressure records, we get a quite good idea about what these animals are doing. So they not only pump water into the sediment, which would be the situation if this pressure is positive. But every now and then, the, the pressure is reversed, which means water flows towards the animal. For example, when they are defecating or burrowing. So it's really like mostly away from the animal, but every now and then also towards the animal. So we did these kinds of measurements with very many different species, like well, the thalassinids with these burrowing shrimps, these thyros, also lacworms. And by doing it in aquaria, we, we, where we could at the same time see what the animals are doing, we could link these pressure records to different behaviors. So now we know that whenever the burrow is excavated by the animal, we see this little very up and down signal. When the, when the shrimp is irrigating the burrow, we see these plateaus in pressure. These huge up and downs is whenever the, the animal is burrowing, or, um, or here when it's feeding, the worm feeding, defecating, like a clock, uh, he's defecating every half hour. And so that gives us good information about what the animals are doing, but also about the physical forces that are related to this. So we can do estimates of irrigate, irrigation activity, how much are they pumping, what are the temporal patterns of those. And we can also produce, we can also listen to those. <laughs> So it's 
it's not real sound, but what it should show you is that there are just a solidification of these data. But there are, for example, birds have set pressure sensors. Some birds have pressure sensors in their bills. So I would not be surprised if they use this kind of information when they stick the, the, the tail in, 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 the, in the sand to find their prey. Because oftentimes you see these animals with a bill in the, in the sand, waiting for a moment or sticking around a little bit, but then waiting. And potentially these pressure waveforms can help them to find their prey. Now all this is also related to chemical processes. And one big step forward in understanding what's going on in the, in the <coughs> seafloor was the invention of microsensors. So that was back in the 80s. Until then, we did not really know a whole lot about what, what, the, what the chemistry is in these sediments, uh, at least at a high resolution, which is, which is necessary to understand this. So these um, microsensors, they have an extremely tiny tip, and you can go between the sand grains into the sediment, and in every few hundred micrometer, you can measure oxygen, and you get profiles like this. So the black dots here is a profile going from the water into the sediment, and then down, and you can see that pretty much after one millimeter or even less, oxygen is gone. So all the animals that live in the sediment, they need to have some connection to the overlying water because there is no oxygen in the sediment. During daytime, which are the light uh, circles here, there's much more and much deeper oxygen penetration due to the photosynthesis by the microphytobenthos. But again, after let's say two millimeters, in this case, oxygen is gone. So you can have these, from these profile, it's, it profiles, if you do it again and again, you get these time series of oxygen profiles. So again, going from water to the sediment and then over 24 hours. During day, there's more oxygen because there's photosynthetic activity. And then during night, the oxygen is even depleted above the sediment surface in some instances. And if you do lots of these profiles, sometimes these profiles are really weird because suddenly you see that at depth there is still oxygen. But if you do lots of them, like indicated by these arrows, and you put them together, then you can see, well, probably they are burrows, worm burrows. And so every now and then, the microelectrode went through one of these burrows. And so that's how you get very nicely the spatial heterogeneity of all this. Luckily. There are even new technologies which makes this, makes this ne uh, less tedious. So this is a um, technique with, with which I'm working. I'm working right now a lot, which is called uh, planar optical imaging. You, have, you can use, there are some in situ devices, but I mostly use it in the lab. These aquaria, they are equipped on one side with this pink foil, which is oxygen sensitive. And if this pink foil is illuminated with blue lights, they are somewhere here illuminated with blue light, then this camera detects the fluorescence or the luminescence of, a, of this pink dye. And this, this luminescence is dependent on the presence of oxygen. So basically, if you take a photo now of this, you get a picture of the two-dimensional distribution of oxygen. So instead of having lots of microprofiles and deducting a two-dimensional map, you get this nice image which shows you well, the white line is the sediment surface, this here is the overlying water, and down here is one lucky one. And as you can see, it brings lots of oxygen into the sediment. So that makes it much easier to figure out the spatial heterogeneity in these sediments, but it's even nicer because with this camera you can take another picture and another picture and another picture, and by this you get also an idea about the temporal dynamics of all this. So down here is the worm, every now pumping, bringing lots of oxygen into the sediment, they are not super efficient in consuming all the oxygen that they pump. So there's a significant amount of remainder oxygen that is transported into the surrounding sediment and obviously can then be used by the bacteria sitting in the sediment surrounding these burrows. So I did these kinds of experiments with many different species now over several years. And this here is, I think, a very neat species. And there's a very, very nice, huge bed out here at the bridge in Shinnecock Bay of these maldanic polychaetes. If you go directly after the bridge on the left side, there's a huge bed of those. When you go there, you will realize it's really spongy. And this is because these, these worms, they tend to uh, build these little cavities in, in, the, in the sediment. Uh, so these little 
They sit head down in the sediment, so down here is the head, the tail is somewhere up here, they build these tubes. And whenever there is nice fresh food up there, they will bring it down into the cavity and store it there for days which are not so good. And by this, they are also very nicely adapted to living at deeper parts of the ocean where every now and then you get an event where lots of particles come to the seafloor. Then they will hold down this material to their cavity. So in this video, you, I, I overlaid a little bit like the real photograph photography. There is another here. And the oxygen, so not much happening right now in this, uh, in this animal. But soon this guy will start bringing down the surface material and with it, he will also bring down lots of oxygen into this chamber. <coughs> so there's the fresh stuff. And now I think there he hangs out. And now he's bringing down all this yummy stuff and with it all this oxygen. So this is an interesting little microenvironment. There are also some Bibles, which seems to be very clo closely related to these chambers because there, every now and then, they can get oxygen without being close to the surface where they are more, more prone to be eaten by other organisms. So these pressure records, this is again is a 50 by 50 centimeter end farm with a thalassinid shrimp. And what I want to focus, what I want to just show here that we can, if we combine these pressure records <coughs> with these oxygen records, we directly see how they relate to each other. So whenever the animal is pumping water into the sediment, so inducing a positive pressure, we see, for example, if we just look at this upper profile, which is through the sediment surface, we see this rise of anoxic pore water out of the sediment. Whenever the animal is excavating the burrow and there is a negative pressure, water, oxygenated water, is drawn down into the sediment. So on this time series of oxygen through the sediment surface. And this is just at one location at the sediment surface. So this animal does not only affect here where the burrow opening is, but it affects the entire sediment surface in this aquarium by moving the water up and down. So this is how it looks with thalassinid. These different chambers, this is the, these are the places where most of the, of the oxygen is penetrating into the sediment. And the shrimp is obviously irrigating this burrow in very different parts of the burrow. And as they extend the burrow, this area obviously, ob uh, obviously increases. So we see this, if we now again look at these profiles here in time, so one profile, and then we go like over 24 hours, we see, see this huge dynamic in oxygen in the sediment. And this is some of the information which is critical to understand how these animals affect microbial activity. So to, to analyze this in a little bit more detail, we can basically look at each of these pixels. So this red dot should symbolize now just one pixel. And we look at this pixel in time and see that there are, sometimes there is oxygen, sometimes there is no oxygen, sometimes there is oxygen, and so on. So with one, some software, we then can analyze, or we can define what is an oxic and an anoxic period, and so on. And from this then, we can define how often, for example, does this pixel switch between oxic and anoxic conditions, or how long are these oxic periods of this pixel. And if we can then do this for each pixel, we get these, well, maps, which has the temporal information in them. So maybe we just focus now here on F redox, which means how often does this, well, does the sediment switch between oxic and anoxic condition? And this is basically this part of the burrow. So the red indicates that about uh, once per hour it's switching between oxic and anoxic conditions. So it's extremely dynamic. And one of the big questions that I would like to answer in the future, how do microbes deal with this? Because some bacteria, they really like to have oxygen, others not so much. And so if you are constantly exposed to these very dynamic conditions, what are the microbial communities that uh, thrive under such conditions? Are there consortia of bacteria that works together? Or are there specific bacteria that are um, adapted to these, these kinds of sediments? So just, just to show you again a full map of one of these burrows, here again the, the map of frequency of oxic and oxic oscillation around the burrow. In the burrow, it's almost always oxic, so that's why it's black, no oscillations. The sediment is always anoxic, no oscillations, but then there is this pretty large sediment volume that experiences these fluctuations. 
So the seafloor really looks like this here. And this is just, well, I assembled lots of different, so the, the Maldana polychaete, uh, Arenigulus for the synods, they all pump. They all have obviously a different rhythm, also depending on their, if they are young or old, uh, so larger or smaller organisms, different depth. Um, so the question now is really, what does that mean for the functioning of these systems? But already quantifying this is, I think, a, a big improvement. And I'm very excited to be here at Stony Brook because Jing Zi and also Bob Aller, so Professor Zhu and Professor Aller, they have developed lots of different optodes over the, over the last years. And I would really say this is one of the forefront of, of, of doing this kind of using this kind of type of technology. So Professor Zhu has now op developed optodes for pH, well, this is O2, for CO2, for H2S. So our idea now is to combine all these uh, in, aquar in aquaria, but also in situ, and see how the dynamics of oxygen relate to dynamics in these other four water parameters, which obviously all together are responsible on, for processes like organic mineralization and nutrient release to the sediment surface. So, and in this context, it's also interesting to look how the infaunal organism respond to changes in environmental conditions, for example, hypoxia or low oxygen concentrations, the increases in temperature, ocean acidification, because it not, may not only be that they are gone, but that behavior changes and these patterns of uh, geochemical, dynamics pattern, uh, ge geochemical dynamics change, so and ultimately will then have uh, an impact on, on sediment biogeochemistry. And with this, I would like to thank, obviously, you for coming here. Also, lots of collaborators, especially Lubos Polarecki, who is now at the University of Utrecht. He basically, well, introduced me to this planar optic and imaging. Sarah, uh, Sally Wooden, and David Webby, they were my professors in South Carolina. With them, I worked a lot on this combination of planar optics and pressure sensors. And then, well, lots of other people all around the globe, because I was so lucky to well, go to different places and to, do, to use their um, uh, laboratories to run all these experiments. And I also would like to mention, because there are a few graduate students here, that I, this fall I will offer a, a topics course on sediment animal, inter, uh, sediment animal interactions. So if you're still looking for a great two credit course, you're welcome to come to main campus. Thank you very much. And obviously, looking forward to questions. Thanks, Nils. Uh, are there questions? I've got one. Mm -hmm. So has anybody tried geoengineering uh, anoxic sediments by dumping tons of worms or shrimps or bivalves mm -hmm. in there to oxygenate them and try and you know, fix the problems that exist? Not that I know of. But I think it would work. You think it would? <laughs> well, at least if the sediment is still good enough so that these animals can, can be active. And there's oxygen in the overlying water, right? So if you yeah. go to like the Forge River, what is what does the hypoxia have like on the benthic community there? Like are there worms that can live and I mean they live in these low oxygen environments, but that's relying upon the source above them. Right. So is right. that kind of just like a big unknown as to what the effects of hypoxia on well, these worms and shrimp is? With, with, it's not a big unknown, but uh, so with um, hypoxia, it's obviously a matter of magnitude. So how low are the oxygen concentrations? And then even more importantly, how long are they? So here in many regions, you have these dial cycling hypoxia. So during night, when everyone is respiring, even the plants that are photosynthetically, that will photosynthesis during the day, they also respire during night. So during night, oxygen concentrations may drop significantly or it may even get anoxic. But during the day, when the sun is there again, then there's photosynthesis, so oxygen goes up. And at least these short periods, there are many species that are adapted to that. All the intertidal species, they have to, have to cope with uh, anoxic conditions during low tide. Mm -hmm. But if, well, if you have, right, let's say, several su successive high tides with no oxygen, these animals will die. And there are many studies that have um, done these studies where they uh, put a chamber over, over the seafloor and obviously over time oxygen is depleted, so typically all the animals come up and eventually die. But then it's a matter of 
how long is this event? Other questions? All right. Well, let's thank Nils for a great talk. Thank you. I'll take your mic off before mm -hmm. we start saying something. Yeah.